Father, we don't even deserve to be here except for your grace that is sufficient. Cleanse us, Lord. Grant, Heavenly Father, that our worship this evening will not be in vain because we call upon you to minister amongst us. You have a word for each one of us. Please, Lord, none of us is righteous. And so we ask you to make us what you would like us to be, holy and acceptable. Come now, tabernacle amongst us, because we pray only through the righteous one, Jesus. Amen. This evening, I want to ask a question. Can a spirit-filled Christian fall? Holy Ghost filled Christian can they fall? Related to that is a question. How do the mighty fall? When you look in history, you discover that we often begin a Christian journey very well. But something else happens. Go back and look at bulwarks of faith like Father Abraham. Go back in history and look at bulwarks of faith like King David. Go back in history and look at men of faith and men of integrity like Solomon. Look back and see the men that walked with Jesus, slept with Jesus, talked to Jesus, fellowshiped with Jesus. These men of faith, like James, Peter, Paul himself, ask a question. How do the mighty fall? What happens in life or along the process of time? How do the mighty for David gives us a clue because he was in a similar situation a man after God's own heart a man who desired to follow God wherever he went a man who knew what it meant to agonize with God he was a man that God trusted and entrusted with spiritual responsibilities but it is this man oh, dismally how do the mighty fall how do the mighty men fall so we go to the book of Psalm Psalm 51 that gives us a We are impressed by what he did as a small boy. We are impressed by his humility. We are impressed that when they were looking for the would be king, the young man was not even there, he was taking care of the dumb animals. And so he didn't even mind when they were calling for big brothers to come and line up for the anointment where the servant of God was going to anoint. Not after riches. He was not after post. He was not after popularity. He was only after God's heart. Now when you come to look at David, the man after God's own heart, how could he do such a heinous act of not only commit adultery, but also murder the, 
the, the husband of the woman. How could he do such a thing? The question is, how do mighty men fall? David gives us a clue. In Psalm 51, verse 10 and 11, he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take the Holy Spirit from me. Evidently, once you move from the presence of God, once you move from the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit departs, you are on your own. Once you are on your own, you have no chance with the evil one. Because a man without the Holy Spirit is not born of God, is none of God. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Bible says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. He may profess what he may. He may say all kinds of things. He may even do some good works. But without the Holy Spirit, we are none of God's. And that gives us the importance of the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, we are in the hands of the evil one. Satanism becomes our attraction. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. Bible records, so I say, live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. So that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and like I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes in you, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against touch, there is no law. How do the mighty fall? Let's go and find out how this mighty soldier fell. His name, Solomon. Go with me to the book of Kings. 1 Kings chapter 11. And we'll find out the steps that go into a mighty man falling. But we want to first of all read chapter 3, 1 Kings and verse 5. Just to give us a clue as to this man called Solomon. Solomon. We know Solomon to be... The wisest man that ever lived. And the richest man that ever existed. 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. <laughs> God cannot make such a mistake. To come to me and ask me a similar question. He will be shocked and surprised. God, God knows who king. God please. Thank you for saving me from that question. Anything. First of all I would say Lord are you serious? 
But Solomon never asks because when God talks to you, he means business. He is definitely serious. And God says, ask anything you want me to do and I'm going to do it for you. Solomon, no wonder he's wise. Solomon responded, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, and I'm only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So, give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. Who is able to govern this great people of yours? God was listening. Lord, just give me wisdom to be able to tell between right and wrong so that I'll be able to govern and lead the people in ways of righteousness. That God said, ha, I was not expecting that. Verse 10 says, and the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in ministering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you did not ask, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime, you will not equal, among, you will have no equal among kings. What a good response for a young man. Now obviously, if it were the majority of us, we would ask for longevity of life. Lord, let me live to the ripe old age. And if it were possible, let me be found when you come alive and kicking. And please don't even let me get old. I want to be running when you come in the clouds of heaven. Then remember, Lord, we are so poor. And I have been so poor ever since I was small. Give me wealth that will confound and confuse all the enemies. And by the way, destroy them all. That's what we'll pray for. But this young man prayed for wisdom. And God says, not only am I going to give you wisdom, but I'll even give you long life, and I'm going to give you wealth, and I'm going to give you riches, and I'm going to give you everything. Nobody will be as rich as you are. Nobody will be as wise as you will be. God grants him that. A man after God's own heart. Then things began happening. To this man who pleased the Lord. This man who walked after God's heart. This man who built the temple for God. This man who led the children of Israel to God. This man who controlled the entire kingdom. And focused their minds on God. What more can you ask for a man such as this? He is wrapped upright. He is holy. He is really interested in nothing but the development of spirituality. Until something happens. Chapter 11. This is the beginning. How do the mighty fall? 1 Kings chapter 11. Then the Bible says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women beside Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites, they were from nations about which the Lord had taught 
after their gods. Mistake number one. Compromise number one was to strictly disobey the order of God. God says, do not intermarry with the people who don't worship God. Yes, you are wise. Yes, you are rich. But, do not intermarry with the strange people who never worship God. Don't intermarry with them. Are you listening to me, Solomon? And Solomon says, sure. Nevertheless, Solomon loved many foreign women. And let me tell you, men, women are powerful. Men, women are powerful. If I were going to ask you right now, which one of all human men is never controlled by a woman in the house? There was silence in heaven. Because every thinking, right thinking man knows that the person who is controlled in the house is a woman. Yes, a man is the head. But the neck controls the head. Somebody had a dream. It was in heaven. And men were lining up. And an angel said, All those men that were never influenced by their wives. This line. And all those who were said were influenced by their wives, this height. And people started separating. And the line that were influenced by women was the longest queue. There was nobody on the line that were not influenced by women. Only one man walked there looking around. And when he arrived, that line, he stood alone by the window until an angel came to him and says man what are you doing in this line look at all the men have gone to the other line how come you are the only one here then he said my wife told me to come here Bible says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. Now, it is sufficient to be under the influence of one woman. But Solomon, do you know how many he had? One thousand women. He had, that's verse 3, he had 700 wives of royal birth. And 300 concubines. And his wives led him astray. Watch out. The power of a woman. Don't underestimate the power of a woman. And so men, don't you ever say, I am going to marry her because she pleases me. Even if you know she is not leading you to God. For you are going to say, no, I'm a man. I'm a man. They will follow me. I'm a man. I'm a man. Yes, you are a man. You are the head. She's the neck. You are not going to control the neck. Necks are hard to control. They are the ones upon which the heads rotate. And let me tell you this, man. My friends. Let me tell you this. Any house where there is confusion, it is because of the, the head. Any human being who is mad, crazy, it's not the neck, it's the head. It is not the toe, it is the head. 
they will say there is confusion in the brain. You know? And so the brain has to think wisely how to treat the neck. And if the brain inside there is outgrowing the head, it becomes a tumor. So make sure you reduce yourself within the function of the cranial. Don't outgrow. You know, when the brain begins expanding, you are dying. So keep the same size. Men, if you want to live at peace with a wife, know your limits. One word to a wise man is enough. Just know your limits. Here is what the Bible says here. Verse 2. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. And I want to tell you this, my friends. It doesn't matter how wise you may be. If you are going to intermarry, with people that want, don't worship God, they will lead you into satanic activities and satanic agencies. It is clear in the Bible, you cannot be wiser than the devil. So the Bible says to, to the Israelites, don't intermarry with them. But then this gentleman, verse 3, verse, uh, the, the verse 7 verse 2 says, nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. That's the beginning of the four. Holding fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And his wives led him astray. What was happening with his wives? Let me read verse, the next verse 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. So, mistake number one. Half-hearted consecration to the will of God. For his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. As the heart of David his father had been. What does that suggest? Compromise. 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 And compromise is an evil that has crept in Christianity. Compromise on the word of God. Compromise on what God says. Compromise on the thus saith the Lord. Compromise on the standards of righteousness. Compromise on anything that God has given us as the directive. The moment you compromise, you are going down. Compromise. Why? Do people compromise? Several reasons. Galatians chapter 1 gives us the answer. But chapter 1 and verse 10. Bible says, And am I now trying to win approval of men or of God? If I am trying to please men, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Compromise comes when people try to please their friends so that they can be accepted. The moment you begin pleasing somebody, pleasing your friends, you are going to compromise the principles of God. Don't be men pleasers. Be a person who can only please God. When you can please God, you ask yourself one question. What is the will of God? What does God want me to do? And when you can answer that question, what God wants you to do, you go back to the Bible and let be led by what the Bible says. And when you are led by the, what, what the Bible says, you will know what his will is regardless of what your friends say. Stick to the Bible. Stick to the will of God. People compromise to please friends. People compromise to be accepted by friends. I remember when I was in secondary school. I was brought up in a very good Catholic family. Although my father and mother were sniffing. You know that, uh, is it here? That, 
cigarette which they put in the nostrils. That, that's what the cigarette was in those days. And if you were smoking this one which is long and you puff, you were out of line and out of sync with society because those are things of the world. But a good Catholic would sniff. And so my father, my mother, and most members of the society were sniffing. But I was told, you are too young to drink, you are too young to sniff, you are too young to smoke. Wait until you grow up. So the question was, was it right? It was the time of when? So went to secondary school. And with the influence of friends, to try and please my friends, those who looked like they were guys, those who walked like guides. You know, whenever you are young, there is a way you walk in society. That distinguishes you from any other ordinary person. Guys have a way. And, and, and for us in those days, we had a way. And I don't see these guys nowadays. You know, you people are so humble. Congratulations, young men. You are so humble. You are good. As we used to walk a certain style, you know, there was a, a small bounce in it then you know that uh, now that's a guy. You don't just walk like everybody. The rest of them were just walking like this. But for guys, they had a certain step, a, a bounce, as if as if, as if the souls are filled with some 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 prickly stuff. So you 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 you, you step and then you step in. And then I saw another guy come to our school. Came to our school the weekend. He was coming from another different school. And the way he was walking. We laughed at him, but after he had gone, we all started walking like him. He would he would walk like this, then shake his head. Walk like this, then shake his head. Walk like this, then shake his head. And, and we thought that was cool. So we compromise to please our friends. Compromise. So watch out the kind of friends you have. I would rather compromise coming to church than going outside the church. Rather compromise sticking to the principles of God than sticking to the principles of the evil one. Friends. Solomon had friends. One thousand of them. Women. Compromise. Number two. People compromise to get ahead or to be promoted. They compromise the standards of God to get ahead, to find a job, to be promoted at the workplace. So they relax the standard. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But you relax the standard so that you can keep your job. They compromise to get ahead. They compromise to be promoted. They compromise. They even forget what God has said deliberately. But I want to tell you, once God has spoken to your conscience, you will always hear his voice. The record says, he speaks once, you hear him twice. That's how God is. So they compromise in order to get ahead. Solomon was already rich. Solomon was already wealthy. He was wise. But he still wanted to be accepted by others. To be promoted, to be ahead. Now, whenever you compromise, there are consequences that comes with compromise. There are consequences. Number one, it weakens your faith. Compromise in one area of your life leads you to compromising in many other areas of life. Because once you compromise in one, you are likely to compromise in many other. Once you compromise with one path, when we you know, when my friends just told me that just, just, just one puff, just, just one small cigarette, just, just, just test it. So we went to, and they said, no, 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 no. You are supposed to breathe it in, breathe it, so that it gets into your lungs. And so go to the second one. Coughed and coughed and coughed. They said, no problem. The next time it will be better. And indeed, the next time I didn't cough. Then eventually, it became a habit. And eventually, 
we were all smoking and drinking compromise it leads you to compromising in other areas of human life so that you can be accepted by friends so that you can be accepted by either a husband or a wife so that you can be accepted by your employers compromise how do the mighty fall they compromise they begin with little acts of unrighteousness the very little sins it weakens your faith number two it discourages others whenever you compromise you forget that some people are watching you there is always somebody who is watching you there is somebody who is looking at you and they admire your faith. And so when the difficulty situation comes and then you compromise and backslide, it weakens the faith of all those people that are watching you. There is somebody watching you. You may not be a pastor, but there is somebody watching you. And when you are going through difficulties, there is somebody who is getting the source of courage from your courage. You are being watched. So you don't have to live just like everybody else. Somebody is watching you. So when you compromise, somebody that is watching you is discouraged. Number three, it denies you of a testimony. Because when the situation comes, God will not put you in a situation that he does not provide a way of escape. And so whenever you are found in a hard place, there is always a way out. And since there is a way out, hang on there. Stick him there. Keep on going. Because when you keep on going, you will have a testimony at the end. Somebody says, every test will produce a testimony. And so keep on holding on to your faith. Because there is a testimony. If you compromise, you deny yourself of a testimony. You start seeing other people come and testifying on what God has done in their lives. And you'll be sitting there with no testimony. Power of God cannot work in a person who gets discouraged easily. People who, get, who compromise never live up to the testimony. We cannot read anything in their lives. So don't deny yourself a testimony. Three Hebrew boys had a decision to make. Either they get swallowed up into the flames... Or God intervenes. And so they stood for what they believed. No moment to compromise. And so when those trumpets were sounding. And the instruments were being blown. They were tempted. They could have been tempted to say. Well let me just reduce my height a little bit. And just scratch my my mind. Maybe tie a boat or, or do something. So that they just don't see me. Other people are watching. And when they were being thrown into the fiery furnace, God was watching. And God himself descended from the throne. He says, if you are going to throw my children and my boys in the flames, I better be there first. Because whenever you are suffering, God suffers with you. And when you are rejoicing, God rejoices with you. There is no pain that does not pass through Jesus first before it reaches you. And so Jesus himself, the creator of the universe, the one who created fire, the one who created even the ice, came down and entered into the fiery furnace and commanded the fire, shut up, my servants are about to come in. And fire cannot touch a soul whose mind is stained upon me. When God makes a decision, there is no fire that can burn, not even a one hair. They went in there. They found it was already cool. They began walking around. And all the old king looks through and sees the young man rejoicing, having fellowship in the midst of the flames with somebody who looked like the son of man. How did he know? Daniel, the three friends, had told him how God looks like. So he says, hey, those boys. And there is a fourth one. He looks like the son of son of man. Let me see. Who is that one? 
And then he came closer. And he says, please, call them up. Come, boys, come out. And they walked out of the flames. How do you walk out of the flames? You know, you walk out of the flames, you know, knowing that I am protected. I am under the protection of God. You are proud because there is a testimony. God has just done something wondrously. And every enemy is confounded and confused because you are able to stand in times of trial. Consequences, it weakens your faith, discourages others, denies you of a testimony. God's word, compromising on God's word in any situation, reduces the power of God to work. The Holy Spirit moved in and cooled the furnace. The Holy Spirit will always be drawn towards people who read his word. But we go back to this man. How do the mighty fall? King David tell us what happens. And he gives us the clue. Number one, compromise. Number two, verse six says, Verse, verse 4. Solomon grew old. His wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. Watch out. Half-hearted allegiance. Watch out for half-hearted allegiance. It is either you are totally for God or not at all. There is nothing like I'm standing in the middle ground. There is nothing like I'm half for the devil and half for God. You are either completely in the devil's net or in God's basket. You might as well make a decision from today onward. Lord, help me. I have compromised so many times in many situations. I want to stand by your side. And so, his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. There are so many things that draw our attention. Popularity can draw your attention. Riches can draw your attention. Fame can draw your attention. Advancement of a career can draw your attention. But let God be the one to promote you. Don't promote yourself. Because if you promote yourself, you will compromise in many areas of life. And then he continues. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of Ammonites. You know, Molech and uh, Ashtoreth were just the same god. What this god was, was a god that was built, built with hands folded like this, extended out like this. It was a god that had a, a head of a of a bird and the the sharp beak with open nostrils and then right under the, the the arms was the fire so that that fire when they roasted and then in the hands they would take their own children and sacrifice to Molech by bringing these small babies that are wiggling and crying. Then they'll come and place in the hands of Molech and then put fire. And when the child is being roasted, the smoke is entering the big nostrils of this hidden God. Child human sacrifice. The devil has changed the strategy. Now he kills people in accidents and sucks their blood through Satanism. It is still the same principle. So, he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. He did not follow his God completely. So half-hearted allegiance is dangerous. Can a spirit-filled Christian fall? Solomon fell. 
verse 9. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart has turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden for Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. Now listen to verse 11. One very important statement in my vision says, So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to another one of your subordinates. Now, the most important and the key word is, Attitude. 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 Since this is your attitude, your mental focus, your direction in life, and your trend in life, deliberate wanting to go against God's law, that's your attitude. Since that's your attitude, God says, I am coming in and I'm going to punish you because of the attitude. God does not punish people for incidental sins. It is the attitude he is concerned about. You are not righteous because you did one act of righteousness. Because your attitude is not towards righteousness. It is just that one isolated act of righteousness. That one isolated act of righteousness does not make you holy, does not make you pure. Your attitude is what counts. You may insult somebody. You may do something that is of a disobedience to God. But what is your attitude? Is your attitude the attitude of rebellion? Or it is one that isolated act of disobedience. If it is one isolated act, God will forgive you. But if it is your attitude, your direction, the trend in life, God will frown at you. The attitude. I want you to think of your attitude. What is your attitude? Which direction are you going? Is it the attitude of obedience or the attitude of disobedience? Look at Moses. Moses led the children of Israel, stubborn children of Israel. They nearly stoned him several times. They insulted him. They did all kinds of things against him. Until that one time, Moses was so angry, so furious, he took that rock, he took that, uh, that low rod and went to the rock and said, do you want us to take this water out of this rock? And he hit the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock. And the moment he did that, God says, you have not lifted my name up. And because you did not lift my name, you are not entering Canaan again. Moses pleaded with God. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. You know, I, you know how these people are stubborn. It is because of their fault and so on. And God says, no way. You are not going in. Period. Stop even praying. And you know, when God told him, don't even pray, don't even st stop praying, it's because he knew. There were so many times that God had made a decision. He was going to wipe out all the children of Israel until Moses came and said, no, Lord, you know, you, know, you cannot do that. What will the other people say? You drove all these people from Egypt just to come and destroy them here. No, let's come. You have told us, come, let us reason together. So I'm just taking advantage of this. Let's reason, really. You cannot really destroy everybody. Now, if you are really going to destroy them, then destroy me first. And then God says, all right, okay. I'm not, I've changed my mind. God changes his mind. Even when he has determined he was going to destroy them, he changed his mind because there is somebody who was willing to intercede and to ask and to ask and to ask. But this time, God says, I'm not even going to stop even praying because you are a dangerous man. Once you start praying, I might change my mind. So stop praying. So he did not even allow him to continue praying. And Moses was so disappointed. God says, come to the mountain. Come with your brother and leave everything in the hands of your brother. He must have been disappointed. You know, if I were Moses, I would have been going to the mountain grumbling. No, Lord, you know, it was not after it was not even my fault. These people are so stubborn. You know how they have treated you. You know how they... Now, no, 
Lord, please. Anyway, anyway, isn't it? And, but he reached there, and you know what happens? And God says, take off your clothes. He took off the clothes. Put them on your brother. And leave him all the instructions. And then he said, what next? God switched off the oxygen. Pah, that's it. And after Moses had died, the devil came. And the devil was rejoicing. Yes, he is a sinner. My body. This is mine. This is mine. Jesus comes and says, the Lord rebuke you. Isn't this the brand plunged out of fire? He is my son. No, but he disobeyed. That's why you didn't even allow him to enter the kingdom. And Jesus says, his attitude was not rebellion. His attitude, his trend in life was towards righteousness. He made this mistake, but my blood has covered it. What is your attitude like? God is so merciful. God is so kind. It is your attitude that will determine the direction where you are going. Can the spirit filled Christian still fall? Solomon, after all these messing up, Solomon came to realize and went to God and says, Vanity is vanity. All is vanity and striving after wind. I'm coming, Lord. I'm coming back. He must have sung that song. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming, Lord. The path of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. And God did not say, where are you going? Which home? You have messed up life. You have soiled it. You have disappointed me. Go back. No. God stands there and welcomes Solomon in. And the last acts of Solomon, are they not written in the book? God accepts the worst sinner back into fellowship. Can the spirit filled Christian sin? Yes, he can. Can he repent and come back? Yes, he can. Because there is a God who cares. There is a God who understands. There is a God who looks at your attitude. What is your trend? Which direction? Is it in rebellion? If it is in rebellion, there is no way he can forgive you. Look at Peter. <laughs> My man. These are men. Peter. Fisherman. Peter. Peter. During that storm. And Jesus was come, coming walking. And Peter says. Hey. Who are you? You are Jesus walking. Can I also come? And Jesus said. Joe. Come. And Jesus walked. Walked. Walked on water. Have you ever walked on water? You. Not even in the bathtub. He walked on water. That means he was in such close communion with Christ that he was able to walk on water. All the others never walked on water. But Peter walked on water. Until he became afraid. And he sank. But he's the only man who bears the testimony walked on water. Now when we are redeemed in the new kingdom, we will all be walking on water. But on planet earth, it's only Peter who will say, I'm the only man who walked on water. That same Peter, it is the same Peter who came and flatly denied God. Denied him. Who? Jesus. I don't know that fellow. I've never seen him ever since I was born. Don't even talk to me about that man. I'm just here warming myself by the fire. Don't even talk to me about that. I don't know him. No, but we saw you. Me. Aren't you the one who even drew the sword in trying to defend him? I don't even have sword. Can you look? Have you seen a sword in me? He flatly denied. What is worse than denying Jesus? That 
that was the same Peter who was among the group that were sent two by two and they went and drove out demons and brought healing and they came back rejoicing and Jesus told them rejoice that your names are written in the book of heaven but it's the same Peter who denies Christ where did the Holy Spirit go? Can a spirit filled Christian fall? Peter the same Peter after he was gone to preach in other areas. Same Peter. When the Jews came, he was afraid of them. He started, to, no, 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 well, I don't mix with these Vasogas. <laughs> we are Jews. As Jews, we don't mix with these foreigners. The same spirit filled Peter. And yet it was the same Peter whose shadow brought healing. Shadow. You know what a shadow is? Shadow. The man just walked and the shadow of Peter resurrected the people who were sick. It is the same Peter. Can a spirit-filled Christian fall and still remain in the fellowship with Christ? The attitude. The direction. Where are you going? Paul. 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 You know, if you were Paul, if, if Paul were here, don't, don't do it, those of you who are up there. If you sleep there and you fall, there is no Paul here to wake you up. There's no Paul, he's not here. So don't even lean against those things. You'll be dead and gone and we will sing, see ya, bye. But Paul, Eutychus, fell broke his neck and died. Paul came down and touched the young man. And the young man rose up. Paul. The Bible says Paul would just use the handkerchief. And whichever the handkerchief touched, Paul, everybody was. But it's the same Paul who could not work with Barnabas. They entered into such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas and Paul, both spirit-filled. Can spirit-filled Christians fall? So don't remain away from God just because there are weaknesses in your life. Because there is a God who cares. There is a God who is concerned. There is a God who can redeem. That's when David says, please Lord, I have realized the secret. Don't take thy spirit away from me. Because if that spirit leaves me, I am doomed. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Ask for the intervention of the Holy Spirit. Don't be discouraged. Just ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because wherever the Holy Spirit is, your attitude will be in the right direction. If you are going to fall, fall going to Christ. If you are going to fall, fall running to Christ. Not running away from Christ. Hey, let me give you this last one. It is found in Matthew. It is found in Matthew 27. Hey, I love this man. His name is Judas Iscariot. Because he gives us lessons. You know, Judas was a man who ate with Christ, sat with Christ, heard from the lips of Christ, was a schooled under the education of the master teacher himself, Christ. But Judas compromised. The desire for riches and the desire for wealth was overpowering Judas. And after he had decided that he was going to sell the master, he sold him. And when they bound him and laid him away and handed him over to, the, to Pilate and the governor, Judas, who had betrayed him. Now, if at all there is some things that you can do, please betray anybody else, but not Christ. Betray anybody, but not Christ. Betraying Christ. The man who redeems. The man who is a healer. The man who is a resurrector. The man who is a creator. And you betray him. Judas betrayed the man who was able to give him the gifts.
betrayed Christ. And after, you know, the only way that, the, the only reason he betrayed Christ because he thought, he thought that he was going to make a little bit of money and Jesus was going to simply shake those things, shake those people and fall off and he walks away and runs away and, and, and Judas will come running with a big of money. I have made some money, let's share. He did not know what he was doing. And after he betrayed him, in verse 3, now listen to this. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. That's a good thing, isn't it? He was sorry. Seized with remorse. Ah, sorry. Messed up. Yeah. He was filled with remorse. And every true Christian, after he has messed up, must be filled with remorse. Judas was a Christian. He was filled with remorse. Step number one. He was sorry. And he did not end there. He went to step number two, the same verse, and returned the, third, the 30 silver coins. What is repentance? Repentance is turn and go back. Bring back. So he was filled with remorse. He was sorry. Then he took the money and walked back to the temple and says, here's your money. I have betrayed innocent blood. Now here is what it says here. To the chief priests and the elders, he says, I have sinned for I have betrayed innocent blood. That's confession, isn't it? He confessed. The man was sorry. He repented and he confessed. He was sorry. He felt bad. He ran back, handed over the money, and he confessed publicly, I have sinned. I have betrayed innocent blood. Did three very important steps in a Christian life. But that's not over. And then the Bible says, they said, what is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. So Judas does the fourth step. He threw the money into the temple. And then the Bible says, and left. I wish the Bible had stopped there. I wish the Bible had stopped there. Because Peter had done exactly the same thing. He had denied Christ. He had insulted Christ. And from there, he was filled with remorse. Peter was fair sorry. He was filled with remorse. And the next thing that Peter did was to run back to the garden. Exactly spot where Jesus was confessing. He confessed his sin there. And then he came back. And he felt sorry. He confessed. He says, I have sinned. When the cock crow, he realized and says, I have sinned. And also Peter left. Judas left. This is what makes a difference. It is the direction where you are running to. Listen to what the Bible says. He left. Then he went away and hung himself. He did everything right. Peter also did everything wrong and then started the right direction. But you know, the difference with Peter was he ran towards Christ. Judas ran away from Christ to hang himself. How many times have you felt that life is so unfair and you want to commit suicide? Run to Christ. Run to Christ. Run back to Christ. It doesn't matter how much you have messed up. Get back to the cross. To the suffering Savior. Because Jesus will look at you. Just one look will be sufficient. And couldn't find one willing to be the supreme sacrifice that was needed that could buy eternal life for you and me Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, 
Had it not been for the old ragged cross, had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever. willing to drink this bitter cup although he prayed father let it pass from me and I'm so glad he'd never call heaven's angels from his Had it not been for that ragged cross, our souls would forever be lost. Thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to drink that bitter cup. We that have gathered tonight, we have resolved that your spirit should always abide in our lives. Yes, Lord, we have messed up. But Father, remind us that we need to check our attitude. Yet at the same time, not to be so presumptuous so that we stay in rebellion thinking your grace is sufficient. Give us, Lord, the ability to know that if our attitude is positive towards you, you will accept us back. Accept each one and fill each one with thy Holy Spirit. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.